Hi, and welcome, and thank you for joining into our fourth in the series of Home Learn webinar sessions, with this one on our E1SL control board that's used in all of our automatic sliding doors. Hopefully, you've all had some time to digest the information in the previous webinars we have been doing, but please feel, feel free to go back to them and leave a comment with any questions. Uh, each session that we're doing is split into a main presentation lasting about 15 minutes with a Q&A session afterwards. Uh, due to the popularity of these webinar sessions, we are carrying on for a minimum of two weeks, uh, again on a Wednesday with the next on the 6th of May at half past 10, uh, where we'll be looking at the E124 and the EO24S. Uh, as I mentioned, there'll be a Q&A session after the main presentation. We're currently having uh, like 12 or 15 people watching. Um, so depending on the number of you guys' questions have, we might not be able to answer them all live. But if you leave a comment uh, down below uh, or a question, I'll leave a response on there for you. So you can come in and check in at any time. Uh, as before, in a few hours, this webinar will be available as a replay along with all the others. Uh, and we do have links updated on our newsfeed on the FAC website. So we'll make a start and go straight uh, to it. So let's bring out the presentation. Here we go. Hopefully you guys can all see that. So what we're going to be looking at, uh, essentially introduction, key features, um, the E1SL board, uh, it's a true plug and play. Uh, we're going to run, go through the setup, and then my personal approach of how I go about with new installations. Uh, also looking at the intercom, compatible accessories, and then we'll just go straight into the questions and answers you guys might have afterwards. So, introduction, the E1SL. Basically, it is one board that essentially rules them all. We, we have one board that sits inside all of those operators that you can see surrounding the one ring. Um, it's the same board that goes into telescopics, sliders, into the A1000, the 1400, the our hermetic doors. Uh, it goes into our bifold doors, our balance doors. It basically goes into essentially everything that we do uh, with it. So it's a very versatile board, which makes it very easy for you, uh, for engineers to have one board sat in their band stock for any replacements or anything you might need to do. The other thing as well that we uh, not specifically mentioned in this presentation, but we essentially have two motors. We have the motor that goes into the A1000 and also into the older A100s. And then all other automation that we do on sliding doors use the A1400 motor uh, in there instead. So again, you essentially need to keep two motors and that's it. So if we go into the next bit, the key features. What we've got is we have obviously a USB port where we can do a firmware upgrade and download and upload configurations. Uh, we can also do timers and event logs. The timer and event logs, you need to obviously put the little CR2032 battery onto the board. And using the SDK Evo, you need to set the date and time for it. Uh, but the options is basically you could, if you had multiple doors, like uh, 10 doors in the same building, they're all going to basically be the same operation. You don't go have to change, go through the configurations on all of them. You can do the first one, download that configuration onto the USB stick. I just take that USB stick to the next door, loads the configuration into the board, run setup and just walk away, let it do its business and it'll come back. Uh, obviously, like all of our FAC control boards, they use a LCD display with our FAC standard of the plus, minus and F. On this unit, we have colored and dedicated terminal accessories to make life as easy as you possibly can for you, with six programmable inputs and two programmable outputs. We use CAN bus for a smart management of intercom, which interlock, interleaves, and airslide, which I'll run through this a bit later. Uh, we have a timer function that's integrated into the board. Uh, obviously, you have to put the battery in, so the, the battery is just there to know the correct time. Uh, but it does have daylight savings, so you can turn on and off as you wish. Uh, obviously, you have a switching power supply, so it's quite economical. Uh, the board itself only consumes three watts when it's in standby. We use the SDK Evo as an engineer programming tool. And you obviously have accessories like the LK Evo and the KS Evo function selectors. And lastly, it is Simply Connect ready. So when our Simply Connect modules are released uh, later in the year, you'll be able to plug those straight in and you have remote access uh, to the unit and you'll be able to program the units as well uh, without actually having to go into the cover uh, for it. Now, I said before, the E1SL is a true plug and play board. What I say that is mainly because it's that easy. Um, essentially, you need to put 230 volts 
into it. Uh, we supply you a care to lead plug that you make up yourself. To, uh, obviously, we don't know how long your uh, your power supply is away from your door. You all you need to do is make up that lead, put power to it, turn the power on. You don't need to have anything at all wired into any terminals. It's usually actually best not to just leave it all out for now. And in basic programming, again using the fact standard plus minus and F, the very first function is the only one you truly need, uh, which is as you see below, it's a CF automation model. If you have a brand new board, a, a replacement, etc., it will just say no. If you if it's a unit that is supplied by us assembled, so pre-made by us in our factory, or a complete entrance solution system, you don't even need to do this part because essentially the system has already actually uh, been run for a setup in the factory. But you essentially, if it's a new, you select what type of system you have. One for A1000, two for A1400 Air and the retrofit kits that we can supply you. Three, the RKE1400. Uh, for our hermetic doors. Uh, please don't confuse the RKE with the RKU that's written in the retrofit kits. It does cause, uh, it doesn't behave as you'd expect it to. Uh, obviously four is for our folding doors and number five is for our balance doors systems. All you then need to do, once you set that, you can exit the program by holding F and minus. That'll skip you straight to the end. Hit your SD, press F again, and go back to a Y, and you go back to the usual flashing 50 running once a setup. You run the setup by simply holding the reset setup button, and the control board automatically turns off its own safety sensors and runs for a setup by first closing the door and then opening the door. This should be complete your setup with the doors being in the open position because they're not allowed to close because the safeties are re enabled at that point. It is worth noting if your doors end up in the closed position, then all you need to do is change the direction of the rotation of the motor. It is generally the second parameter you usually see after you change CF uh, onto it. And basically means you don't have to do any wiring changes or changing any the belt configurations. You basically just tell the motor to run the opposite way and just rerun the setup again. Now, you've run setup, now what? Basically, I put it down into, I use like a four step approach for it. First thing I like to do is actually disable the closing safeties again. So I access advanced programming, that's the F and plus. And then the first parameter you see is P1. I change that to a no, and then I do P2, change that to a no, exit programming, go back out. At that point, the door should close after two seconds on the default, and it'll stay in the closed position. I can give it a trigger. If you look at the bottom, you've got J21. I can give it a trigger between G and I1, and the door should open, sit there for two seconds, close again. This is where I now like to adjust the pause times, the closing speeds, the opening speeds, and the night pause times. Those are custom adjustable things that you want to do with it on there. And once it's at the right thing, then you will readjust it if you need to, just keep testing it. My next step is usually I add the activation sensors and the threshold safeties. So I basically wire them in, well, I recommend the use of our XDT1 combination sensor that we supply, as the manual is written with this sensor in mind, and the instructions are color coded to match the cabling supplied with the sensor. And you can basically see essentially what you're looking at on the left of the, with the representation of the doors, and then you have the connections. Um, you do need to obviously double check that the basic functions, C1, C2, are still set as they are, though those are actually the default settings and you have to re-enable the safeties back up again. P1 goes to 20, the 1F and the 2F that you see on there on the right-hand side, they are your fail-safes. It's basically just saying the board will run the fail-safe check. So that is a normal configuration you do onto it. If you are using other people's sensors, you can still follow the same logic you can see on here. I1 and I2 are activation triggers. The S1 and the S2 are by default closing thresholds, uh, normally closed circuits. You have Vs for voltage, Gs for grounds, and T for the A test function that is done on there. My third step is, again, based on the assumption I'm using opening safety sensors instead of protective uh, pocket screens, I wire in the opening safety sensors. Again, I recommend the use of the XBFA infrared sensor that we supply, as again, it's the manual design with this particular sensor in mind. And again, the instructions are color coded to match the cabling supplied with the sensor. Again, you can see a basic illustration showing where the sensors will go. And again, you can see the E function on it. 
Uh, these ones, you will need to go into the basic function and adjust C3 and C4 to 21 respectively, because 20 is closing, 21 is opening safety. And turn on the failsafe checking by the 3F and the 4F. And you will obviously need to double check that the advanced function, the upper one, is set to 5 for test. Now, there is something just to highlight on there. If you can look on the J22 right at the bottom, uh, for the V, the two greens and the two reds both go together into the V. They don't stack up, going like green to V, red to G, brown to O1, and blue to O2. I've usually seen that happen a few times, and it doesn't work properly. The door just keeps opening slowly. But once you've got it all wired up, that's where you now drop the cover down and you test the system in accordance with BSEN 16005 or BS7036 uh, 0214. And you use your test object. So that's a cardboard box uh, you guys should probably all have uh, sitting around the back of the van. And there's going to be the new ones are 700 by 300 by 200 mil tall, uh, usually in a like, light gray and a black kind of color, if I remember rightly. And you test that the infrared sensors are preventing the door hitting you. Um, you're also testing that the infrared sensors aren't seeing the door themselves. And you're also checking your activation distance. That's when you look a bit strange and you're as you approach the door from different directions to see um, if it picks you up within a minimum of one meter uh, for it. And once I've got all that working, this is where I now wire in emergency triggers and I configure my battery backup functionality. Uh, we generally suggest people to use the red block for the emergency triggers uh, for it. And you can see you've got input one and input two. And we have essentially the three, sorry, the, um, the different options you have there on the sides. So you've got emergency opening, emergency opening with memory, emergency stop, and emergency closing. It depends on what your customer wants the door to do in the event of emergency uh, onto it. You might notice that there's emergency opening and emergency opening with memory. What's the difference? Emergency opening basically means that essentially trigger goes in, the door will go open regardless. And it'll sit there for as long as that trigger is in. As soon as that trigger drops off, the door will basically return back to normal, close and time out and close. If I have emergency opening with memory, what will happen is that the door will have the trigger, it will stay open indefinitely, but once that trigger drops off, what it will do is it will stay in that position. This is for where for sites where they want to have somebody going around and do a visual check that the doors did what they were supposed to have done in the emergency. Um, so they can confirm, yep, that door went open circuit when the command came in. The other thing that I next do is I configure my battery backup functionality. Uh, always make sure you configure this, otherwise it doesn't make any difference. And you have the battery backup. Um, you have a opens immediately, closes immediately, or carries on operating to the last movement before the battery is fully discharged is either open or closed. One of the things that we have on our control board as well is a night battery kit system. So where again, you can change what it does. Um, this with the same options before. This is for where, if you imagine you had a shop, for example, um, uh, let's say curries, for some reason they don't have a, any locks. During the daytime, a normal opening hours, in the event of, uh, of an emergency or a fire alarm or something like that, basically, or the power loss, the door will go open immediately. At nighttime, you don't want the door to go open immediately. You want the door to stay shut because there's nobody in the, in the store anyway. This is assuming they're, they're using our electric locks in the system. The intercom. What is it? Uh, again, a lot of people asking, uh, what's it mean? Intercom is short for intercommunications of the E1SL board that, that we have um, built into the system. It basically is communications between the, uh, the E1SL control boards and includes the air slide process as well. What we have is the CAN bus technology basically allows all balls to talk to each other and you can set up one E1SL ball set up as a master to control all others in the network, up to 15, including the master, when wired in the daisy chain method like you see on the right. Now, what basically this means is you don't have to have like a program selector on every single door. So if you went for a, uh, let's say a shopping center where you have say 10 doors, you can basically set the main entrance door as your master and have a daisy chain cable, like a, um, we usually recommend a Cat5 cable linking that one to the next and so on and so forth on there. And essentially a security guard can go to the master door 
and flick it to night mode. That will then basically tell all other doors to switch into night mode automatically. Uh, you can also do it with the timer. So the timer would basically, uh, the master would switch into or into night mode and every single other one would follow at the same time. The other thing that you can do is you can have doors communicating with each other. So we have one SDK Evo that is essentially and effectively in charge of two S lights, uh, an interleaf configuration and a interlock configuration as well. So you can do interlocks as well. The interleafs, that is a master slave setup for sliding doors, essentially. Uh, it's for like, if you imagine you had a big entrance, you want to open, uh, have a clear opening of around about six meters. One single door operator, six meters clear opening is not generally possible. But you can do it using our systems. You'd have, say, an A1400 one side, A1400 the other side, single door three meters, single door three meters, and you set up the interleaves functions. You have them talking to each other. They basically behave as one operator, which again means that you can now open and have a massive clear opening. And then we come into compatible accessories. Uh, obviously, you've got the KS Evo, which is the key switch one, and the SDK Evo. Uh, those will be uh, ones you use uh, for when you need to lock up the doors, uh, have a, uh, if it's like an escape type route, um, which is required by the BSEN. You got the LK Evo, which is more for generic uh, doors. We have the XCT1 and the XBFA. And we have the S Lite, which obviously works in conjunction using the comms communication between the two. So you have variable speed controls. And that brings us to the end. And we come up to any questions and answers. So hopefully we'll see what people have come up on here. Let's bring back down to this bit. And right, so. What have we got? Any questions? I mean, if you can't think of anything to ask at the moment, uh, then obviously just come back at a later time and put any questions on there. Um, but anything in the meantime that you want to go through, uh, just let us know. Um, if not, the next uh, one that we're going to be doing will be on the E124 and the EO24S. Uh, we're primarily going to be looking at sort of programming. Um, the more advanced features you find with the easy board and also kind of like looking at the basic comparison between the EO24S and more uh, simpler 24 volt boards. At the moment, there is nothing uh, on the question. So hopefully uh, you've all found this a useful. Um, oh, hold on. Wait, we do have one. Here we go. Uh, Darren. Um, we have double motor kit. Uh, yes, you can add a double motor kit. Uh, the no double motor kit uh, will essentially be a second motor that is in replacement of the pulley on the only useful on the A1400 systems. And there is a little control board that stacks on top of the existing E1SL. And it's just a function selection that you tell the, the unit that you now have a double motor. One of the things you'll see is if you select, say, an A1000, you can't even see that particular option. Uh, you only see it if it's an A1400 type system. And Tracy, can the operator be used with third-party sensors? Uh, yes, it can. The only thing is we need to check how the third-party sensors work. Um, you do get, I think it's the record sensors, which use a plug-in. So they plug onto the boards, uh, onto their own record system. Uh, those ones can't really interface with. Um, unless they've got a normal trigger functions, like a normally open circuits for activations, normally closed circuits for threshold safeties. Uh, if they're using their own little um, CAN bus plug thingy, um, then obviously that won't work with ours. Here we go, Vince. Uh, the s light sensor. The s light sensor is um, not a sensor per se, but essentially it's a air slide. What you basically getting is a curtain built in between the actual jams itself so what you get is instead of having the normal air curtain so if i use my hand as an as an illustration so that's your normal door okay and typically your air curtain sits like about here and you get blown hot air just blows straight down and what you can find is if you stand either side of the entrance it's usually quite a bit colder because the hot air coming down convection basically means it basically pulls colder in essentially um still gets a warm but that's all it does the air, our air slide system sits actually in the jam itself. 
what you get is because we use the air that's inside your own building, we don't heat it. So for one thing, our power consumption is ridiculously smaller than any typical air curtain. Uh, I think I briefly worked it out. A four kilowatt curtain normally costs you about 2,000, 600,000 electricity every year alone. But the air slide for the equivalent amount of usage, even if it was on all the time, uh, would only cost you 400, 500 pounds. That's it. Uh, but the air slide is only sitting in the jam and is only activated when the doors open. So because we have the integration with the CAN bus between the air slide processor and our other control board, the air slide knows exactly when to come on. And we can obviously have it coming on at different speeds, depending on what you want it to do. So full speed when it's all the way open. And I think you can have it just a partial opening. You can have a lower speed because you don't need, don't need as much power. Let's see if there's anything else. Oh, where's my mouse? Oh, there. Sorry. Uh, uh, instructions for the A1400s, uh, they'll be in the email as you get um, from afterwards uh, from Sarah. We'll make sure we get the, the presentation will be attached and I'll get the E1SL instructions for it. Tracy, uh, the energy saving part of the operator is something that is essentially innovative to us. So we're the only ones who can actually do the functionality. If you imagine, you have, even if you have directional sensors, the ones that basically detect you moving towards the door and ignore you walking away from the door, basically everyone else's operator, when you're walking towards the door, doors will essentially, the radar will see you and your door will open all the way regardless. You can have a zero pause time because so there time and then basically starts closing. But say if I'm a user, I come towards the door, doors are shut. I see the door, the, the operator, uh, sorry, the radar sees me coming towards it. It opens. And I change my mind and go the opposite way. Door will still carry on doing its opening cycle. It's probably a bit easier. So if I have the person on here coming towards our door, and our door, oh, I change my mind. Our door would have only done that, would have only opened a little bit and then closed straight away, which basically means that all your heat or cooling that you have inside your building stays inside the building and doesn't escape the door. So you reduce the number of unnecessary activations obviously the xct1 is a very advanced sensor so it has a good facility to filter out the side movement people just walking past the doors uh, obviously you need to play around with it and check it still works correctly and still detect somebody within the one meter um but the energy saving feature is generally only as well for the a1400s where we recommend the best um mainly because our operator is designed to have um usually for those heavier type doors what have we got Anything else? Oh, hold well on. Uh, normal cycle time on a 1800 opening. Uh, just trying to think. Uh, usually should be open in about one and a half, two seconds. Um, I think. Um, not without checking on the actual instructions themselves. Uh, but yes, I think it's about one and a half to two seconds. Uh, should be enough for it. Okay, let's see if there's anything else. Uh, let's just, I'll give it a few more seconds, see if anyone else posts any more questions onto it. No worries, thank you very much, Tracy. So, yeah, so hopefully you found uh, this a useful uh, webinar for you. Uh, we wanted to do something on the on this particular board. Well, I wanted to do something on this particular board because I find it quite a innovative board in the way that we can use it for pretty much all of our operators. Um, also, again, if you had a A100, A140, you can just replace this control board. will go uh, into the same units. Um, obviously, the only ones that's not compatible with is the are really old legacy type products from the 930, 940 range uh, on there. But it's a very nice, very versatile, and easy to use control board. Cool. Thank you very much, Robin. Uh, obviously, since that is Robin, if you have any questions on automatic doors for quoting purposes or anything like that, uh, please get a hold of uh, Robin Palmer, who's the automatic door sales manager. 
So we'll be glad to help you answer any questions you may have as well on for uh, automation purposes and for quotations, etc. Yep, so I think that's uh, all the questions we have so far. So thank you for your time. Uh, don't forget, in about usually it takes about an hour and a half, two hours. Uh, this uh, webinar will be available as a replay. Uh, so feel free to come back, rewatch it again if you want to watch it. With um, like, actually, it's not available at this time. And obviously, if you do have any questions, if you leave the questions below, um, I can then pop any comments on the response on them to see if there's anything else uh, the that I might have missed or anything, or that uh, you want covered instead. Okay. Many thanks, and thank you for your time. Take care.